be in Matthew chapter 6. We're back in Matthew. Uh, we, we stepped away last week and went to the resurrection passage in 1 Corinthians. And, well, we're coming this week back to the Sermon on the Mount. And as we've been going through Matthew together, uh, we've seen in the Sermon on the Mount uh, that Jesus is talking about the standard of righteousness and what true righteousness really is and, uh, and how in our heart, He's showing the Pharisees and scribes that their system uh, doesn't work, that they're sinners. In Matthew 15, we looked at this quite a bit, verses 18 and 19. What comes out of the mouth proceeds from the heart, and this defiles the person. For out of the heart come evil thoughts, murder, adultery, sexual immorality, but false witness and slander. And Jesus has shown that all through chapter 5, that, that the heart of the human condition is the condition of the human heart. And, and then we came to chapter 6 and we saw that, that Jesus started to address the way they were behaving and we said a few weeks ago if you wanted to you could say chapter 5 that Jesus was correcting their teaching right you have heard it said but I say to you he's, he's addressing their teaching or their doctrine <coughs> and in verse or chapter 6 he is addressing and correcting their behavior when you pray pray this way when you fast don't do this when you uh, give don't do this and we've talked about that quite a bit, not just in Matthew, but all through First Timothy. Uh, the first thing we studied through together that the what a person believes and how they behave are inseparable. Uh, they go hand in hand. And so, in chapter six, uh, two weeks ago, we looked at verses one through eighteen, and we focused in on verses one through eight and verses sixteen through eighteen. We're coming back today to verses nine through fifteen. But in those verses, what we saw was Jesus. And talked about what they believed, and then it goes to their behavior. And the problem is, the reason their behavior was incorrect is because their belief was incorrect. They had a self righteous uh, standard of belief, and so they acted self righteously. And when they gave and helped people, when they prayed, when they were fasting, it was self righteous. And we saw in the beginning of chapter 6 that Jesus warns about that about doing things just to be seen by others, uh, doing things to cause other people to think a certain way about them. And we discussed how the point of those passages, verses 1 through 18, those are three examples Jesus gives. That's not all of the possible examples there are. Those are the three practical examples Jesus gives. And the idea is this, that when you do something for God, it should be for God. Uh, if your prayer is just so other people will hear you and see you pray and think, oh my goodness, what a great spiritual uh, titan this person must be, then you're not doing that for God, you're doing that for yourself. Or when you give, if it's just so you can tell everybody what you're giving, then, then that's not for God, that's so that you can look a certain way. And Jesus pointed out in those verses, uh, verses 1 through 18, that when you do things for God, it should be for God. That's the purpose of our existence, right? It's, What's the chief end of man? To glorify God and enjoy Him forever. And so it's not about doing these things to, to get adoration and attention and praise for us, but it's supposed to be for the adoration and attention and praise of God. And so we come to verse 9 through 15 of Matthew 6. In the middle of that, Jesus gives this correction of how we're to pray. It's this model prayer that He gives. And we're going to see here, too, the same idea. I've said this a lot. It's not mine originally. I get it from multiple other men. But it's a good definition. Worship is when our heart's affection and our mind's attention is focused and directed towards who God is and what he has done. Amen. And so in our giving and our prayer and our fasting and whatever we do that's supposed to be an act of worship, if the affection isn't towards God and the attention isn't towards God, then it's not really being done for God. And so we're supposed to start with who God is, our minds, attention, and our heart's affection. And in verses 9 through 15, we see this model of prayer, and, and, and Jesus begins this example prayer with just that, who God is. And so Matthew 6, starting in verse 9, pray then like this, our Father in heaven, Hallowed be your name, your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Amen. 
Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts as we have forgiven our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. <coughs> Excuse me. And, and verses 14 and 15, then, he follows that whole prayer like this. For if you forgive others their trespasses, your heavenly Father will also forgive you. But if you do not forgive others their trespasses, neither will your Father forgive your trespasses. And so there's a couple of things we're going to cover and get to through there. But, but the first thing I want to point out is that this is a model prayer. Right? Jesus says, pray like this. He doesn't say, pray this. Right? That's important. He doesn't say, pray this. He says, pray like this. This is a template or an example. It's a model of how we're supposed to pray. It's not that we're just to recite word for word this every time we pray. And we know that clearly because of what he said in verses 5 through 8 about prayer. And how don't be like those, he says, the pagans or the Gentiles that just have meaningless, empty words and phrases. It's just a recited, heart, heartless, memorized kind of liturgy or ritual. He, this is not what that is. This is a model prayer. Amen. Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Amen. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our debt as we also have forgiven our debtors. And lead us not to temptation, but deliver us from evil. And so this is a model prayer and we're going to break down and look at some of that this morning. But, but there's a few things that Jesus does specify here when he says when you pray, pray like this. He doesn't tell us exactly when we're supposed to pray, right? And there are people that try to say that. They try to say, well, you're supposed to pray at these times of the day. Well, you have to pray this many times a day. Jesus uh, doesn't tell us what we're supposed to necessarily look like right, when, when we pray here. There are people who, who believe that, that. You know, if you pray, it has to be on your knees. Or when you pray, you have to have this posture. Or you have to look this way. Uh, and there are people who believe that. And I've even heard people talk about worship that way. I've heard uh, other preachers who've said, when you're in worship, if your head's not up and your arms aren't raised, they'll say, well, you can't. That's not worshipful. But that's not what Jesus is talking about. This is a picture of a person's heart in their prayer. And prayer is a form of worship. And worship's about the posture of your heart. All through Scripture, we see people who are laying on the ground in worship. We see people looking with their arms raised towards heaven in worship. We see people who bow their heads in worship. But what Jesus does say here is how we're to pray. The, the, the posture of our prayer. The, the, the way in which we should be praying. And so, uh, I do want to point this out so I don't forget. And I even... Just for so you know, if this goes, if this isn't interesting to you, that's okay. I even highlighted it in my notes as Tyler's nerd note. <laughs> uh, but there are a lot of uh, translations that include this prayer. For yours is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. Amen. I don't want you to think I'm leaving that out or skipping that. The reason uh, when I've read those passages, it's not in the ESV. It's not in a couple translations. Is because it's not in the oldest Greek manuscripts. Right? I'm not skipping it. I'm not even saying that that's not true. It's just up through the 6th century, that's not in the manuscripts. Right? And, and it was added uh, later over time. It, 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 if you want some clarity on that, if not, you can just not pay attention to this part. But if you want to nerd out with me just a minute, <laughs> I looked into that. Why do some translations have that phrase and some don't? And it's primarily because for the first 600 years, that's not in the manuscripts. And for the first 600 years, the early church writers and fathers, you know, Augustine and those men, didn't include that phrase in their commentaries. Right? Which is a pretty good indication that it wasn't in the copy of Matthew's writing that they had, and they never wrote about it. But it does come pretty early in what's called the didact. And just to give you an idea, that's kind of like, it was, a, it was kind of like buying a commentary, like if you have a study Bible, there's notes in the bottom. And some of you may have a person's study Bible, right? You have MacArthur's study Bible or David Jeremiah's study Bible or something like that. And so you know who wrote those notes. But the didact was written by uh, kind of an unknown group of early believers. So we don't necessarily know who wrote those 
notes particularly. Uh, but that's where that first shows up, and it shows up as like a note in uh, those early manuscripts. It was a note, and, and I believe uh, from what I've researched and studied on that, I, that's certainly true. Is the kingdom and the power and the glory certainly are God's forever. Amen. 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 But it's not in some translations just because it's not in those early manuscripts. But the idea that it was added in the didact, the note there, is to get to the heart of worship, approaching this model prayer as a very worshipful thing. Not something we just overlook, not some liturgy we just, you know, memorize and repeat before a football game or whatever, but to understand that Jesus is talking about the heart of worship Amen. and recognizing who God is and who we are when we come before him. Amen. And so we'll get to this model prayer. The first thing, our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Our Father in heaven. Now, that's significant. Right? That that's the approach. That's the title. When we approach God, he, he, Jesus says, our Father in heaven. And the reason that's so significant is because that terminology for God is very seldom used in the Old Testament. Uh, we see God called Father, right? He's the Father to the fatherless. He's the Father of Israel. We see in the Old Testament Jews, for the most part, address God as Father in a general sense. But to specifically call Him Father, their own personal Father, and that kind of relationship is, is, uh, doesn't happen very often in the Old Testament. Uh, David does, though. In Psalm 89, David says, You are my Father, my God. The rock of my salvation. But it's still a kind of an odd thing in the Old Testament. And the reason for that is because they didn't really understand the, the uniqueness of the relationship the believer has with God because that was only really revealed fully in the person of Christ. Amen. And so Jesus comes and he uses this terminology, Father. He uses it uh, around 200 times just in the Gospels, I believe. Jesus uses it it's, it's hundreds of times. In the New Testament, that God is addressed as this Father in a personal sense. And it's the, the, the word there in the Greek is Abba. You might heard people talk about that before. But it's a very personal uh, relationship word. It's like the difference in someone, you know, you'll hear people today will say, Well, you know, I had a father, but I didn't have a dad. Right? Or you may, you may father a child, but you're not your dad. You're not being a dad. But that word Abba is that idea of dad. Yeah. It's this very personal relationship with God. And so the first thing Jesus points out is that God is your heavenly father. And if you're a believer, you have that close, intimate father-child relationship with God in heaven. It's, it's, it's a, a seen vaguely in the picture between your earthly father. Right? He, he's your dad. And so our Father, it's this loving Father in heaven that we have. And that's important because we only really understand that through who Christ is. I'm only able to approach God the Father as my Father because of what Christ has done. Amen. Amen. And so Jesus, when he talks about God the Father, that is uh, kind of a unique thing in the Jewish culture to talk about God as your Father, my Father, personally. Not just a general sense, but he's my heavenly father. And the religious leaders didn't like that. They, uh, the scribes and Pharisees, wouldn't have done that. They wouldn't have said God was their personal father. We know that they didn't like that because that's one of the main reasons they wanted to kill Jesus. Mm -hmm. right? In John chapter 5, John chapter 5, verses 17 through 19, when Jesus is talking with them, he says, But Jesus answered them, My father is working until now, and I am working. Mm -hmm. This was why the Jews were seeking all the more to kill him. Not only was he breaking the Sabbath, but he was even calling God his own Father. And they viewed that as making yourself equal with God. They viewed it as disrespectful, bringing God down. Now the reality is Jesus is equal with God mm -hmm. because he is God. Amen. But, but but that doesn't change the fact that he also says for us to approach God as our Father. And, and so they would have not done that. It was a shocking thing for him to instruct other people to call God your own Father. But that's what he says, our Father in heaven. 
It's this personal father. He's dad, Abba. We see this idea throughout the Sermon on the Mount. Matthew 6, verse 26, Jesus says, Look at the birds of the air. They neither sow nor reap nor gather in the barn, and yet your heavenly Father Amen. feeds them. Mm -hmm. Are you not more valuable than they? Amen. A few weeks ago in verses 1 through 18, Jesus calls God your Father over and over again, right? In verse 1, your Father who is in heaven. Verse 4, your Father. Verse 6, your Father. Verse 8, your Father. Verse 18, your Father. Today in these passages, verses 9, 14, and 15, Jesus talks about God as our Heavenly Father or your Father. And so that's important that we understand when we come before God, we're approaching Him as a child approaches their dad. A loving dad. A good dad. And Jesus describes God that way in Matthew 7, in verses 9 through 11. And you can turn there if you want to. I'm going to kind of paraphrase it for you for the sake of time. But, but Jesus describes God as a good, perfect, loving, heavenly Father. And he says, you know, what kind of father? Even you as a dad, even me, we're not good dads. We're imperfect. We're sinners. And even you know if your son asks for bread, you don't give him a rock. And if your son asks for fish, you don't give him a snake. And Jesus says, if even you know as a sinful, imperfect father, you're not perfectly loving, if even you know how to give your children good things, how much more then is your perfect and holy heavenly father going to give you good things. Amen. Amen. And so the idea of our Father in that model prayer is very significant. I'm not approaching God like a child that's been called to the principal's office. Yeah. Right? And I'm not approaching God like a police officer that's pulled me over for breaking the rules. I'm not approaching him like a warden of a jail. He's my father. He's Abba. That's his dad. The next thing then, Jesus says, though, is hallowed be your name. Amen. Hallowed be your name. And I think that's important, too, because there's this balance. Is he my heavenly father and I can approach him as a father? Yes, I can. Amen. But he's also holy. Yes. Amen. And I have to remember that. Amen. I have to remember that. He is uh, my father. He's a holy, uh, perfect, loving father. But the, the, the point is, he's still holy. And he deserves honor and respect. And so think of it this way. There are kids today that I have no question. I know that those kids love their mom and dad. But they are not respectful. Right? You can love somebody as your parent and not respect their position. They, they love their dad, but they disrespect their dad. They love their dad. It's kind of like, you know, people say the idea of being too familiar that happens, right? There are people that they get too familiar, children that get too familiar with their dad. And so it's not that they don't love him, it's just that they're not showing him the respect that he deserves. And, and how much more then should we respect our Heavenly Father who's holy? It says, hallowed be your name. And so he is my dad, but I have to remember that I can't be disrespectful or belittling, not too familiar. And the reason for that is because he's my heavenly father. I don't talk to my dad uh, right, when I was growing up especially. Right? I didn't talk to my, my dad the same way I talked to my buddies at school. Well, I did sometimes, and if I did, <laughs> I regretted it pretty quickly. Right? <laughs> but then there are also there are people who do that all the time. They're too familiar with their dad. So there's this good balance of, yes, he is your loving heavenly father. He's not a warden. He's not a police officer that, 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 that you, you're, you're in trouble with. He is going to your dad. Can you get in trouble with dad? Yes, you can. But approaching dad, a loving father, is different than approaching the warden or, or, or approaching the principal in the office. But he's also, hallowed be your name, he's holy. Hallowed means to be made holy. If I'm hallowing something, I'm making it holy. But the thing here is, Jesus says, hallowed be your name. Well, God's name doesn't have to be made holy. It is holy. Amen. Right? God doesn't need to be made holy. He is holy. Amen. So hallowed be thy name, or hallowed be your name, it is a reminder that I have to keep. That I have to remember that he's holy. Amen. Though so I should treat him. Let the way I respect your name be holy. That's right. Let the way that I approach you be holy. Don't let me become... Uh, too familiar and disrespectful. R remind me to treat you 
as holy. And so Jesus says, listen, we come before God, we need to recognize and respect who it is we're talking to, who we're addressing. He is our Father, but He's also holy and, 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 and righteous and deserves honor and glory and respect. So I have to remember that. I can't forget that. So hallowed be your name is God, help me to always treat you as holy. Help me to remember the reverence you deserve. Verse 10. Then he says, and by the way, so far, this model prayer, we haven't prayed for us yet. Now we haven't prayed for us yet. So far it's all been about who God is. Mm -hmm. Verse 10. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Again, still not about me. Jesus is, is talking about who God is, recognizing who he is and, and who you're talking to. And, and as a believer, the significance of what that means, that you can go to God directly because he's your heavenly father. But also remember that he's holy. And also remember that his plans and purposes, that his will is greater than yours. Your kingdom come, your will be done. And so it's this, the heart of a person that, that is willing and to humbly submit to God's will, to his plans and his purposes. And it's kind of like in prayer when you go before God saying, uh, God, before I ask for anything, before I bring my personal petitions to you, before I start unloading all my problems and all the things I want you to fix for me, I, I just want to make it clear that, that ultimately I want what you want. Ultimately, I want what you want. Even if I don't specifically know what that is, even if what I'm fixing to ask you for isn't what's going to bring you the most honor and glory, when it all comes down to it, in my heart, I want what you want, even if that's not what I'm asking for. Amen. Okay. Amen. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. And so the, the reality of that is this, you know, there's times that there's things I want that aren't bad things. They're not bad things. We pray that God would heal somebody we love. That's not a bad thing. Amen. Or, or we pray that God would do something for somebody else. Or that he would work out in a specific way in this situation or that situation. And, and we pray for those things. They're not bad things. But sometimes what we think is the, the best outcome isn't really what's going to bring God the most honor and glory. It's not what it is going to magnify Christ the most. And so the, the idea is, even if what I'm asking for is not bad, if it's not what would most glorify God, if it's not going to lead to the outcome that would most magnify Christ, if it's not going to have the greatest impact for furthering the kingdom, if what I think I want, even if it's a good thing, if it's not what's going to bring the most honor and glory to God and make the most of the gospel, then, then I want what will do that. Amen. And that's the model of prayer. Jesus says, remember, before you even talk about what you're asking for, ultimately you need to have a heart that understands, God, if I don't get that, as long as you receive the most honor and glory, that's what I truly want. I'm willing to submit to your plans and purposes. And so this first section is all about who God is. It's our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name, your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. And there's nothing specifically about me, and there's nothing specifically about other people. I haven't petitioned him for any specific thing in my life. I haven't asked him for anything for others. The, the beginning of the prayer Jesus points out is, listen, remember who it is you're talking to. Remember that, that prayer is an act of worship. And worship is about focusing your mind's attention and your heart's affection on who God is and what he has done. And prayer is worship. It's not me coming to God saying, I want this and this and this and this and this. And if I could get that by Thursday, that'd be great, please. Thank you. <laughs> right? It's about remembering who he is and what he has done and, and how great he is. And, and being humbled by the fact that we can even come before him and approach him and realizing that he's a loving father. And if even we as sinful fathers give our children good things, doesn't he know even more so how to give us what is good? Even if what he gives us isn't what we think is the best, he knows 
what's best for his plans and his will and his purposes. And it's not until verses 11 through 13 that we start to talk about us or me or people, right, individuals specifically. Verses 11 through 13, give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our debts as we also have forgiven our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. And so I point that out, that those are two sections. And I can't help it. I know for the sake of time, I probably shouldn't. But y'all know me better than that by now. <laughs> I can't help it but address something I heard recently. Because here's the deal. This is two sections. The first half of this fall of prayer is all about who God is and his character and his glory and his honor. And, and all that comes before I'm even mentioned. But recently I heard a, a, a preacher give a little short sermon or devo on these passages. And in verses 11 through 13, he said, uh, and I had some theological issues with it, but I think it's important to point out because obviously it's been taught in our own circles. And if you've never heard it, that's great. Now if you do hear it, you'll know it's not true. And if you have heard it, I want to point out to you why it's bad theology. But he read these verses here, give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our debts as we've also forgiven our debtors. And so his understanding and what he preached from that in this little sermon uh, that he gave was that, uh, and this man, I don't believe he's a bad guy. He's been preaching a long time. I don't think he had any ill intent, but this is a major problem theologically because he said that give us this day our daily bread comes before forgive us our debts. And so that means, he said, that God cares more about your well-being than he does your sin. Mm. And then he said, hmm, boy, that'll preach. And if you remember what I said last week, coincidentally, <laughs> every time someone says that'll preach, you should stop and ask them, but should you preach it? Yeah, amen. And, and is it true that God cares about us? Yes, Jesus says that. He takes care of the birds. Amen. How much more important are you than the birds? But he doesn't care more about my well-being and comfort than he does my sin. Right. Because my sin is an assault against his righteousness. My sin is, a, is an assault. It's an insult to his glory. Right. And so to say that God cares more about me than he does my sin is to say that he cares more about me than he does his glory. And if he cares more about that than he does his own glory, then he's not God. And actually, I guess I am. Because if it's more about me being happy than it is about God's holiness, that's a problem. Right. And as he presented that idea, now I don't think that he's thought through all of it. I hope he has it. Because I think if he did, he would say, well, I don't believe that. I don't believe he believes those things. But the idea, if God cares more about taking care of me than he does my confession of my sin, or my sin in general, that means that he cares more about serving me than he does me serving him. And he doesn't exist to serve me. I exist to serve him. That idea that God loves you more and then he despises your sinfulness and he cares more about your comfort and well-being than he does your sin and he cares more about you being happy than he does you being holy, that's the foundation of the prosperity gospel. Right? That you can do whatever you want, but 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 if you give some and, and you're faithful to the given, then it doesn't matter how you live your life, God will bless you because He cares more about your well being than He does your sin. That's the foundation of that. And so when we come to these verses, we need to understand just because give us this day our daily bread comes before give us forgive us our debts doesn't mean that that's a higher priority. <laughs> The, the, the vision is that the first half of this prayer is all about God. Jesus has already made it clear that first and foremost, that we should recognize who God is. And part of that is that he's holy and he deserves glory. So really that's mentioned way before my sins mentioned. His glory is his top concern. Right? And, and that sounds harsh sometimes. That's preached a lot today that God just wants you to be happy. And the reality is, I don't think God's nearly as concerned with your happiness as he is your holiness. Amen. He cares far more about your faithfulness and your obedience and commitment to him than he does what your financial situation looks like or what kind of car you drive. 
Jesus has made it clear that God's glory and holiness is top priority. And so when he says, give us this day our daily bread, more than anything, that's, that's about recognizing again his provision. Right? It's about recognizing what God has done. Not give me something, but give us this day our daily bread. But the idea there is, remember, this is about remembering who God is. Our heart's attention, our mind's affection on who God is and what he has done. And so if I say, give us this day our daily bread, or, or praying to God and thanking God for uh, the provisions he's given me, it, it, it's a way of, of recognizing that, being thankful for that. Even something as minute as bread, right? Such a small detail. I, I don't remember the last time I thought I wouldn't eat today was. And probably we haven't thought that either. Nobody in here has probably thought, you know, I haven't eaten in days. I wonder when I'll eat again. Hmm. Right? For being honest. And, but, but even Jesus said, even your daily bread, even the most basic necessities of life, the reason you have those things is because God has given them to you. He's allowed you to have those things. And some people say, well, I bought the bread. Okay, but God allowed you to, to be able to buy the bread. Well, no, I work a job to make that money to buy the bread. Well, God allows you to be physically and mentally able to work that job. However you break it down, whatever you have, you only have because he has either given it to you or allowed you to have it. Amen. Give us this day our daily bread. That's a heart of someone that is trusting in God daily. Right? Not just for the big things, not just when I'm in a pinch, not just when things are getting bad, but daily trusting that God will provide and that his will will be done. And that whatever that looks like, I know that if it wasn't for him, it would be far worse. Give us this day our daily bread. A heart of somebody that recognizes and trusts God with their day-to-day -day life. Verse 12, he says, and forgive us our debts as we also have forgiven our debtors. And we'll come back to that uh, in verses 14 and 15. But the idea here again is that, that we have a spiritual debt, right? And the Beatitudes, the beginning of the Sermon on the Mount. Jesus talked about the poor in spirit being bankrupt spiritually. You have no righteousness of your own. You're, you have a debt you can't even begin to pay off. And somebody else is going to have to pay it for you. You can't even pay towards that debt, right? You're, you're the negative when it comes to righteousness because you don't have any of your own and then you continue to sin. And so when you're in debt, our sin has indebted us to God. We have violated His righteousness. We, we have this sin debt we can't pay for. And the only way that we can have that debt dealt with, that debt dealt with, is that God forgive us that debt. Amen. Amen. And, and he also goes on and says, lead us not to temptation and deliver us from evil. I want to emphasize, right, that when he says lead us not to temptation, that's not because God leads us into temptation. Right? It's not because God tempts us. We know that's not true. James 1.13, let no one say when he is tempted, I mean tempted by God, for God cannot be tempted by evil, and he does not tempt anyone to evil. So the idea of leading us not to temptation to deliver us from evil, listen, there are going to be hardships and trials in life, and God isn't the one tempting me, but maybe uh, because of my own actions or some other reason, he allows me to be in that situation. I think Job is a great example of that. But also Peter, right? Jesus says that Satan asked for Peter that he could sift him like wheat. And what was Jesus' response? But I have prayed for you. Lead us not to temptation and deliver us from evil. It's the idea of the heart of a person that, that doesn't even want to be in a situation where they would sin. God, keep me from even being in those situations. Keep me from putting myself in those places. It's not that he puts us there. We put ourselves there. God, lead me away from those things. Amen. Amen. I, I'll be honest with you, right? We, we, not only does God not tempt, because the Bible is clear, He doesn't tempt us to evil. He doesn't solicit us to evil. But most of the time, when there's sin in my life, it, it's not even all the devil's fault either. I do a pretty good job of sinning all by myself. That's right. And I put myself in those situations, and I allow things that I know are going to tempt me to be around. And I allow those things to happen. 
And so this part of the prayer is about a heart that humbly comes before God and says, I can't do this on my own. And I need you to strengthen me and help me to avoid the, the temptation of the world, but also that you would protect me from my own flesh. Strengthen me. Help me not to give in to temptation. Give me to strengthen those things. Protect me from the evils of the world and of the flesh and of the devil. It's the heart of a person who wants to battle against their own flesh. Like Paul said, God, that he struggles and wrestles with the flesh. And the things he doesn't want to do, he does. The things he doesn't want to do, he doesn't do. And there's this battle that's going on. And this is the heart of a person that recognizes that and realizes I can't overcome the flesh by myself. I can't battle against the world and the devil and even my own flesh apart from Christ. Again, it's about me, but in the prayer, he's praying for me specifically, but it's ultimately about who he is. I need you to help me overcome these things because I can't overcome them in my own strength. So that's the model prayer before we get to verses 14 and 15 briefly. But he prayed then like this. Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come. Your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. That first part is a heart that recognizes first and foremost who God is and what he has done and what it means to be in relationship with him as your father and his holiness and understanding that despite your unrighteousness and your sinfulness, that God, as holy as he is, despite your sinfulness, still calls you his child Amen. and him your father. Amen. And that's important to keep in mind, right? He doesn't, and we'll get to this in just a moment, but, but when I sin, he's still my father. Amen. When my kid, children disobey me, I will stop being their dad. And they have to somehow become my child again. I'm still their dad. But then he goes, verse 12, uh, Verse 11, give us this day our daily bread, a heart recognizing what God has done and is doing and trusting him daily in our life. And, uh, forgive us our debts as we've forgiven our debtors. Lead us not to temptation, deliver us from evil. A heart that recognizes uh, your own sinfulness and God's righteousness and humbly asking for forgiveness and strength to overcome sin more and more in your life. That's sanctification, right? That's what sanctification is. We talk about salvation a lot, but there's three different aspects of salvation, right? I'm, I am saved. I'm justified. Justification. I'm saved from the penalty of sin. Amen. I will be saved when I'm glorified. I'll be saved from the very presence of sin. Amen. But now, on this side of eternity, I am being saved because I am being sanctified. Amen. And that is being saved from the power and influence of sin in my life. That's what Paul talks about. Those of us who have been saved and are being saved and will be saved. He talks about justification and sanctification and glorification. And in this prayer, there's the heart of that. I recognize my Savior. I recognize He's my Father. But I also recognize that I'm still being sanctified. And I need His strength in doing that. And also, all of that is because of who He is and what He has done. And this model prayer is kind of an example, a reminder of that. Who God is, what He has done. And even my justification and my sanctification, that's because of who he is. I didn't, I, I didn't become his child on my own work or doing. I wasn't saved by my own efforts, and I'm not keeping it by my own efforts. Amen. I need him to lead me not to temptation and deliver me from evil. I need Amen. him every day, daily provision, my daily bread, because of who he is. And, 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 and who I am is someone who can't do those things without him. Amen. In verses 14 and 15, we're going to very quickly cover it because it does get a little confusing for some people. He gives this model prayer. He talks about forgiving us our debts. But then he says, if you forgive others their trespasses, your heavenly Father will also forgive you. But if you do not forgive others their trespasses, neither will your Father forgive you your trespasses. And some people see that in this chapter and they get confused. And they think that you can... Right, you lose your salvation and be saved again, or they talk about different things, or they get confused because they say, well, wait a minute. If all my sins are already forgiven in Christ and they're dealt with in the personal work of Christ, yeah, he's resurrected, all that's handled, then why do I need to continually ask for forgiveness? And how come, if my sins are forgiven in Christ and I'm already saved, then how come I have to be forgiving to others? And if I'm not, God won't forgive me. 
Right? How does that work into the idea of justification? What does that mean? And, and so some people will try to say, well, this is a prayer for an unbeliever to, to justify or reconcile that. Well, I'm going to just tell you, there's no way this is a prayer for an unbeliever. Right. Because for an unbeliever, God's not their father. Amen. He's not their heavenly father. So it can't be for an unbeliever, it's for a believer. Specifically, these are disciples. Uh, later on in Luke 11, the, the, the disciples ask, teach us to pray. And it's almost this exact same model prayer Jesus gives. So this isn't an example of a sinner's prayer. This is this, this is the prayer of a believer. And remember, he's comparing it and contrasting it to the prayers of these unbelievers we looked at uh, in verses 5 through 8, who pray to be seen by others, and they pray with lofty words, and they pray for all these other reasons. And so this is a prayer of a genuine believer being compared to the prayer of someone who is self-righteous and lost. So this is the prayer of a believer. And so what does this forgive us our trespasses? If you forgive others theirs, your Father will forgive you also, but if you don't, neither will your Father forgive you. And the difference is this. Either way, the problem is sin, right? If you're lost, your problem is sin. But even as a believer, someone who's genuinely converted and saved, you know what my problem in life is still? Sin. Amen. I still sin. I'm not sinless. I still commit sin. And so both people, the problem is sin, but the difference is that there's different kinds of forgiveness, if we want to call it that. That's not the best way to explain this, but I think we're seeing two uh, views of forgiveness. There's judicial forgiveness, and that happened when I was saved. God is the judge of the universe, right? Put the hammer, the gavel down, and, and declared me righteous before him. My sins have been judicially forgiven, past, present, and future. Amen. Amen. But then there's also this paternal or family, or if you want to call it a, a parental forgiveness. Right? That, that because I've upset and I've offended or I've sinned against my dad. Mm -hmm. It's not that I'm not judicially forgiven. I'm judicially forgiven. Like I said, with my children, if they're disobedient or they displease me, I don't stop being dad. But that relationship is compromised. It's, there's a fray, right? When, when, when our children are disrespectful or, or, or sinful or do things we don't like, we're not, it's not like we quit being their parents and they have to go ask us to be their parents again. But there does need to be a mending of that relationship. Or with my wife, right? You know, we've been married almost 11 years, and I would argue that our marriage has gotten better. Yeah. She may disagree. <laughs> but we've, in that 11 years, we've said and done things that have been less than kind. We've done things that were sin against one another. But guess what? When that happened, our marriage wasn't nullified, and we had to go get remarried again, right? We had to mend that relationship. And the same thing. Uh, God is our heavenly father. He refers to him in those verses, 14 and 15, as heavenly father. So this is someone who's a believer, who's already justified, and who as far as by capital offense uh, and, and deserving of capital punishment, that's been judicially forgiven. But as a son who has sinned against my father, that relationship is being strained and needs to be mended and reconciled. When there's sin in your life that's undealt with, trespass, that word there means to stumble in the Greek. That when we've stumbled, when we've messed up, when we've slipped up, we have to reconcile with our Father. When there's undealt with sin in my life, I don't have the fullness of the joy and the benefit of that relationship with my Heavenly Father because there's this thing in between us that, that I have to deal with. He's still my Father, I'm still saved. People say this all the time. You've probably experienced it. I just don't feel as close to God as I used to. Well, he didn't move. But there's something in between you and him as your father that has to be dealt with. He's still your father. You don't have to go be saved again. But you, there's, there's something that is hindering and fraying that relationship. And so the idea is this. If I'm not going to work out my relationships with God, then why would I expect other people to work out and reconcile with me? 
any relationships that way, right? There's some undealt with elephant in the room, and the relationship's awkward until it's dealt with. The same is true for your heavenly father. So don't let that confuse you. It's about this fatherly or paternal or family idea of forgiveness. The price has already been paid. I'm already judicially forgiven. I'm not, not, I didn't lose my salvation. He's still my dad. I just have to mend that relationship and grow closer to him again. Just like friends and family that you used to be close to, but you're not anymore. We have to make sure we don't allow that to happen in a relationship with our father, that we remain close to him and seeking his forgiveness for our sins in our life all the time. So we are going to close. I didn't get to, to cover some of the things I wanted to, and I kind of rushed through some of that there at the end. I hope I didn't muddy things up too bad for you. But I want us to understand when we look at this prayer, this model prayer, this passage here, 9 through 15, the, the, the idea of the model prayer is Jesus makes it clear prayer is an act of worship. Amen. And it's focusing your heart's attention and your mind, or your heart's affection and your mind's attention on who God is and what he has done. And that's exactly what that model prayer does. Amen. And so when we pray, we should do that. Remember who we're talking to. Remember what he's done for us. And remember that when we ask for him to do things, that even if what we're asking him to do, we might really want it. But if that's not what's going to be the most honoring and glorifying and magnifying for him and his son, then ultimately we want what is. Because sometimes we'll pray and we'll say, God, I want you to use me like Paul, but not like Paul. <laughs> use me like Paul minus the beatings and the shipwrecks. And, and I don't want to have to learn to be grateful in nothing but I want, to, I want to have the impact of Paul. Just don't, don't use me exactly like Paul. Right? But what if that's how God plans to get the most honor and glory out of your life? God, I want you to use me, but, but don't make me be uncomfortable. Mm -hmm. And so we come and realize who it is we're talking to. And that above everything else, that his uh, will be done. That his kingdom come. That it's about what he wants. And if what he wants and what's going to give him the most honor and glory in accordance with his plans and purposes is that I have to suffer on this side of eternity, but if that's how my life magnifies Christ most, then ultimately I, I need to realize that, that, that that's what I want. Even if my flesh doesn't want it, that in my heart and my spirit I want what's going to magnify him the most and realize the relationship I have with him. And again, the, the emphasis here still, the Sermon on the Mount, is on the heart. There's the heart of those whose prayer and worship is all about them. And then Jesus shows us the, the heart and this model prayer of a person who, who, who their worship is all about who God is. And the way that we approach Him and the way that we view Him. And there's this, this importance of having that relationship with Him as your Father. And, and so maybe this morning you're here and you're lost. You're not saved. You've not been judicially pardoned. You're still guilty of sin. God is not your heavenly father in the sense of, uh, of this family of God. And, and, and so you don't just need that fatherly forgiveness. You need him to be your father first. Amen. You need him to judicially forgive you of all your sin and come into that relationship with him. Amen. But if you're here and you're a believer and you say, you know what, I just don't feel uh, as close to God as I used to. My relationship with him is not the same as it used to be. And I'll say this, listen. It's kind of like when you're a kid, or maybe you have kids now, and you know most of the time, uh, if you're a, a, a dad and you've been away and you pull up, right, you don't even get to sit down before the kids are, yay, daddy's home, right, and they're running and jumping all over you. But on the days they don't do that, you think, what did you do while I was gone, right? Mm -hmm. Because they know they've done something wrong, there's a sin, and it's affected their relationship with their dad. And so maybe you're a believer, in, uh, but you're not as close to God as you have been in the past, or you don't feel the way you used to feel. You're not excited that daddy's home. You're thinking, oh, I hope daddy stays late so mama forgets to tell him when he gets home. Right? And, and working in that relationship. So this morning, if you need to come and, and place your faith in Christ as Savior so that you can call God your personal Heavenly Father and have your sins forgiven, past, present, and future, uh, by the judge of the universe, let's talk about that before you leave. But maybe you're here and you're a believer, and you, you're sitting there and you go, you know what? There's some things between me and my father that I haven't dealt with. And the reason I'm, I come to church as little as possible 
You know, maybe it's the reason you don't pray like you used to. Maybe it's the reason that, that you know, you can't wait to get out and we dismiss and not have to come back till next week. And it's not because of anything to do with us. It's because there's something between you and your Heavenly Father that eats at you and is bothering you. And rather than ignore it, you need to deal with that. Amen. So you can be back in, in the fullness of the joy and the benefit of that relationship. Maybe you need to follow Christ in baptism. Maybe you want to talk about becoming a member of Fair Play Church. Whatever it may be, this morning, just remember who it is you do those things for. Amen. Remember that he's your father, but also that he's holy and righteous and just. And, and last week we had 100 people here. This week, half of that. But it's not because he's any less holy or worthy this week than he was last week. Remember who it is we worship Amen. and what he's done for us. Let's Amen. pray. Dear God, we come before you and thank you first and foremost for who you are and all that you have done and all that you continue to do for us, Lord, especially in the person and work of your son, Jesus. And God, that in spite of ourselves, even though you knew that we would be disobedient, sinful children, you chose to be our father anyway and offer that redemption through your son. God, we're incredibly humbled and thankful for that. And God, I pray this morning if there's anyone here that it doesn't know your son. It's never placed their faith in him alone for salvation. That they would do that before they leave here today. God, if there's anyone here that needs to follow Christ in baptism and become a member of, of the local church, that they would talk with someone about that before they leave here today. God, for the believers here, Lord, that we, we continue to sin and, and we're always going to slip up and stumble. But I pray, Lord, that you would strengthen us, that we would not ignore that, that we would not try to run from that, but that you would lead us not to temptation and deliver us from evil, that we would, when those things come up that interfere with our relationship with you, that rather than avoid it, God, that we would run back to you and handle that with you as quickly as possible so that we can have that loving fullness of the relationship with you as our dad, our heavenly father. We thank you for everything you do for us. We pray these things in your son's holy, precious name. Amen. Amen.